Welcome everybody to the next episode of the Cannabis Review. I'm delighted to be joined on this episode by Dr. Michael Steinhens, who's Assistant Professor of Beef Production in Medicine at Kansas State University. We're going to be talking about a topic of industrial hemp as cattle feed on today's topic. Michael, how are you keeping? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> delighted to have you on. So during my research, I came up with uh, a lot of different names. So you seem to be kind of in the thick of the midst of this exact topic. And as Ireland is such a farming heavy nation, it's a, it's a topic I wanted to cover for a number of people. Can you maybe give everybody a quick overview of how you got into the beef production medicine side of things and where you are at the moment? Uh, yeah, so I am uh, I'm at Kansas State University. I'm on faculty in clinical sciences here and uh, beef production vet- veterinarian. Um, I originally am of Ohio native, so I came from the Midwest um, and was in private practice for a handful of years and found my way back to do a PhD in clinical pharmacology. And I am um, now on faculty here at Kansas State. Uh, my research interests are um, pharmacolog- pharmacologics and are, that are involved in pain mitigation and looking for ways to measure pain in food production animals. Okay, amazing. So you guys, uh, on my research, I actually come across a load of stats that I didn't think. I know agriculture is the largest employer in Kansas, and a large chunk of the state is given up to the agricultural sector. I didn't think it was as big as it is. So there's no better taste uh, or case study than you guys to be able to be researching this uh, first and foremost. So from the research I've had, the biomass from hemp seems to be a good source of protein and fats for a cow to you as biomass but the 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 transaction of the milk being given from the to the calf from the mother is the point of consternation is this correct and uh, how far am i off on that and so um here in the united states our food and drug administration has um come straight out and said that feeding cannabinoids to any food production animal or any animal, in fact, um, is considered an adulterant in the feed. Um, And so it is not legal here in the United States to feed any sort of cannabinoid, um, you know, plant matter, uh, CBD oil, um, hemp, hemp meal, things like that to any, any animal, even food, um, even your companioning animals, like your dogs and cats. Um, That's, they're, they're trying to figure out the safety profiles of those, um, which is kind of odd because the FDA considers hemp seed here to be generally regarded as safe. And um, But, you know, you can't feed it to your dogs, but you can give it to yourself. Um, so it's there's kind of some confusion as to what the laws are and what's legal. Um, and part of our big research and part of our USDA funding is to kind of answer those questions of, you know, if a cow is happens to be fed industrial hemp, um, do those cannabinoids enter the system? Uh, and do, where do they go into that into that animal's body? Um, and if it does enter the milk, does it? You know, how long is it in the milk, and I'm um, at what levels? Okay. And do you guys have a set time of uh, execution for these studies? Is there a point where you're going to sign off and be able to give the FDA or something approval and say, look, we can categorically prove that this does not hinder the process, or it does in X, Y, and Z? Yeah, so we've um, we've completed two studies. Um, we have one in, one single dose study out in publication now. We have a multi dose uh, study that we have under review right now in the peer review literature, uh, and we've also completed a tissue residue study. So we use the FDA's guidance for industry to how they approve um, drugs in food animals. So if you give a drug a drug to a cow, um, the way they measure how long that that safety period from when that animal is injected. To when that animal can enter the food chain, uh, we followed those study guidelines, and we're currently in analyzing that study for uh, edible tissues, so muscle, kidney, fat, and liver. Um, we plan to do a milk production, um, a milk uh, transference study, uh, the first part of this summer. So is the the goal for that. We should have that data uh, wrapped up by the end of the summer. And do you see, are a lot of the cows fed on soy feed over in the U.S. as well? Is that the kind of primary uh, source of feed for cows or for cattle? So um, for cattle here, depends on the type of beef cattle here in Kansas. Or a lot of them are grazed or fed hay over the winter. 
Um, some are given a, let's call it a total mixed ration. Uh, so basically everything into a big pot um, and fed out to them. Our dairies are fed primarily on total mixed rations. So everything is provided um, in a big, you know, it'd be like a salad bar all mixed up and then put in front of you on your plate. Um, and so, but the main source of protein, in a lot of those is alfalfa and soybean meal. Um, and there's push, especially in the poultry industry uh, for hemp seed to work in there. Uh, and as a protein source, because hemp seed meal, so the extract after they remove the oil um, is pretty similar in composition, a uh, little bit different fatty acid profile, but the protein content is very similar um, and whatnot. So there's a push in the poultry industry to kind of replace some of the soybeans oil meal with the hemp meal um, for that fatty acid profile is what they're going after. Yeah, well, I think you've got the two-pronged attract of you've got lower carbon emissions if you're able to utilize a biomass that's being thrown to the wayside initially anyway. You've kind of got two markets, one being able to create jobs and revenue and another being able to less reliant on an, a, an import coming from a, a foreign territory. Yeah, exactly. And our um, one of our big pushes um, for Western Kansas, and we have a lot of farmland out there that's irrigated and ran off what's called the Onaga, Onaga Aquifer. Um, and so the, there's a finite amount of water there. And those producers are looking for ways to basically reduce any amount of water they have to use to grow crops. And so um, that's a big push out that way um, to use things like hemp because it uses so much less water uh, compared to traditional row crops like corn and soybeans. Okay, interesting. Second topic I wanted to jump at is if the farm grown version of hemp has a trace amount of THC and that seems to be the barrier for entry for it being used as a product, what are the options of synthetic versus farm grown for uh, providers of uh, feed for cattle and for farm animals? So you, when you talk synthetic, do you mean like a plant that's been modified with no THC? Or do you mean uh, synthetic yeah, again, cannabinoids? Or a singular, a, a, sing, a singular cannabinoid, let's say, or a specific set of group of cannabinoids or a mixture or a combination, let's say that's a formula some company might develop themselves as an IP. So that would be um, here in the United States, those would automatically be labeled as drugs. Uh, and so you're starting to go, you go completely away from, you know, a forage type diet that's feed to a um drug and feed drug and that's a whole set of different regulations um here in the united states um there are the fda has come out and they have said you know thc is one drug they consider a drug and they also consider cannabidiol here in the united states so cbd to be a drug and that's because there's an fda approved formulation um, for humans uh, for seizure control and so they consider automatically they consider that a drug because they have an approved cannabidiol label here in the United States. So those are the two that would meet a lot of pushback from the FDA. The other ones they would, if they were pure chemicals, they would still consider those a drug by definition. Um, and they you'd have to go through those formal approval processes, uh, which are quite lengthy and quite a bit of an investment uh, on the back end. So, yeah, that's the only thing that. You could have one major one or two people who've got the capital to be able to do this and have got the ability to be able to make a product that are they the ones that may be able to cut out the farming industry from being able to use that as a revenue source yeah that's the um concern that would be the concern and you know the big concern they would have then also they would probably also know that um, farmers being farmers if it's green and they can feed it to a calf they're they're going to try to feed it somewhere along the way um, that's the way a lot of producers here in the United States are um, if it's a, a, a lower cost, but a similar you know, product in the end, they're going to go for the more economical choice when it comes to feeding cattle, because that's the biggest expense we have here in the United States for feeding animals for raising animals is that feed intake um, and putting feed into them. Yeah, well, I think a farm is a perfect example of having a circular economy in the one space. You need to use everything for something at some stage along the lines. And exactly. And, you know, cattle for our, you know, in the United States are wonderful recyclers. Um, I don't think people appreciate how much biomass from the food industry actually ends up into cattle. Uh, you know, anything from potato chip waste to 
carrot waste to vegetable waste that, you know, that's not fit to enter the human food chain, uh, but it's safe. They can still enter the cattle chain. Uh, they do that. And as well as um, the ethanol industry here in the United States really relies on um, as a cattle feed. Uh, and so a lot of cattle here in Kansas are fed uh, distillers grains from our ethanol industry. Um, it's almost to the point where the distiller grains drive the ethanol industry more than the ethanol drives the ethanol industry. So, <laughs> And last topic I just wanted to bring up is, do you guys do much research on the endocannabinoid system and other farm animals? Is it, a, is it something that is even being researched at the moment? Because I'm sure if it works for cows, you, will, you know the ECS is in most mammals, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, so we do not do endocannabinoid research in our lab uh, at the current time. Uh, we just aren't set up for it right now. Um, we, we're focusing kind of on the food safety aspect as well as the, um, you know, transference of cannabinoids in the body. Um, we originally got into this uh, industrial hemp just looking to see if cannabinoids would be a useful tool for analgesics. Um, and we've, we were, we're quickly, um, taken back by how little data was out there and how much had to be filled in. And so we're still trying to fill in those voids uh, before we even get to our original goal uh, for research. Um, but there is some research out there, um, it's particularly in dairy cattle, um, looking at endocannabinoid system um, around the time of calving. Um, and there's some interesting data out there, you know, it, it's upregulated uh, during the time of the postpartum period. So when a cow gives birth, um, that system's upregulated, um, the receptors are, um, as well as cattle. They've, one study I found were cattle that have endometritis, so an infection in their uterus or infl inflammation of their uterus, um, have increased endocannabinoids um, circulating in their system um, in those animals. So a uh, lot to learn about that system and how it plays into the balance of inflammation, because all, all inflammation is not bad. Um, and we just have to figure out how to, you know, balance it so we don't completely shut off a system that uh, we know is useful, um, you know, kind of likes the Cox pathway. We know parts of it are very useful um, and we just want to shut off parts. You know, you don't want to get shut off the whole thing and cause, you know, renal issues and things like that. OK, amazing. Well, we're just coming up to our time now, Michael. I could actually talk to you all day. It's been a highly informative. I think the work you guys are doing there might be going under the radar for a lot of people, but there it's cutting edge stuff. And I think you guys open up the door for a potential new we can put random figures on these industries like people do, but a potentially lucrative industry that could be homegrown and a, a circular economy, economy within the United States and replicated in different territories around the world. Exactly. Um, there's a lot to learn about this plant, where it can fit into our production systems. Um, definitely the varieties of biomass that are, you know, considered uh, byproducts and how those can fit into cattle rations. There's a, quite a bit of variety there. Um, and I think about all parts of the plant could be and biomass could somehow fit into a cattle ration pretty easily here in the United States. Yeah, no, I think it's a uh... A lot of people with the sustainability and have been able to develop their own feed. As I said, the research you guys are going to do should lay the groundwork for a, a number of companies. As I said, we're a farming heavy industry. It's already been practiced over here to a degree. It kind of just needs the validation of uh, scientific scientific papers like yourself. So thank you very much for coming on, Michael. Hopefully we can chat again maybe in a year and we can touch base and see how everything's going for you guys. Absolutely. Love it. Perfect. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank Take you for having episode. me on. Cheers, Michael. Bye-bye.